All right, gentlemen. Hi there. Hi, everybody. Hear me okay? Hey, yeah, we hear you fine. Oh, good. I hear both of you as well. So we've gotten past the Zoom, uh, the Zoom <laughs> gauntlet. How are you guys doing tonight? I'm uh, doing well. The weather is uh, not good for observing, though, tonight. We've got no, uh, no. overcast skies, and there's a threat of rain later on tonight. So, yeah, Like I was saying earlier to, uh, uh, to John and uh, Gerald, uh, I was on Highway 5 this morning, and everything looked great. It was nice and clear. And then I hit the Altamont Pass, and it was this giant wall of fog. And I said, oh, it's not going to be very good tonight, I think. So uh, that's where we're at. So before we get started, though, with the astronomy news of the universe, um, we will uh, remind you of a few things. The first being that the Chabot Space and Science Center is still closed because of the COVID epidemic. And as uh, uh, in addition to that, we are in the process of uh, remodeling a good portion of the Science Center. And the second piece of news is that we're reopening in November. So uh, stay tuned for um, the Chabot Space and Science Center reopening, uh, back to hopefully uh, public viewings through our telescopes uh, and the usual activities from uh, Chabot and the East Bay Astronomical Society to resume in the latter part of November. Um, I also want to remind everyone that during these times, we can really use your support and if you're so inclined, there is a donate button on your Facebook page that will allow you to make a donation to the Chabot Space and Science Center. Or if you'd like, you could visit the website at ChabotSpace.org and uh, learn about becoming a member of Chabot or uh, making a donation from there. I also want to thank Fremont Bank, uh, whose support to Chabot is incredibly valuable and uh, valuable to the community as a whole. So thank you, Fremont Bank. And uh, I guess we can get started with uh, some uh, news stories of the week, and we'll be able to answer questions you may have. Uh, Gerald, what was the uh, big topic that you had? Well, actually, we have several things. Uh, first of all, congratulations to uh, SpaceX and the Inspiration4 crew, who just returned this afternoon after spending three days in space. The first all civilian, all commercial uh, space uh, orbital space flight. So that was pretty pretty cool thing to do. And uh, I heard them talking afterwards. This is going to open up the path for all of us to be able to someday take a ride into space, as yeah. long as you've got about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to spare. Yes. You know? yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> All, right. of, well, all of us, this right? Th <laughs> yeah. th this brought up a question tonight during an earlier discussion of uh, uh, of EAS members who got together before our meeting. Um, what does this do to the definition of the word astronaut? Well, there's there's still astronauts. The the definition of the word astronaut simply means that you have risen more than 62 miles above the surface of the earth so by international agreement space starts 100 kilometers above the surface of the earth 100 kilometers is 62 miles so if you rise above that level you are an astronaut no matter how you get there so uh now are there Professional astronauts and amateur astronauts. I, I, I get right. I, I, get, I think they well, call them civilian is, astronauts. You know, <laughs> this is what I'm getting at. All right. So you have, you know, when you think of the word astronaut, you think of Neil Armstrong, right? And to buy a ticket to go into space and sit in a chair in the spacecraft and also be called an astronaut is that kind of disrespecting <laughs> Neil Armstrong and all the NASA astronauts who have spent like half of their life training and becoming experts in their spacecraft. Good question. We may have to change the definition here. This sounds like another Pluto problem to me. <laughs> 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, well, anyway, <laughs> congr <All right. laughs> congratulations to the, <laughs> the SpaceX team and the Inspiration4 crew. Uh, very nice flight. Um, my my wife and daughter and my daughter's boyfriend and I were all watching the uh, when they emerged from the, sp the uh, spacecraft uh, this afternoon, and uh, my my, it was either my wife or my daughter, I can't remember which one, commented about the lovely spacesuits that they wear. And I pointed out that those spacesuits that the, uh, the, they wear on the, on the Crew Dragon was designed by a Hollywood costume designer. So <laughs> that's why they look so good. <laughs> so, well, this is my point exactly. <laughs> Okay, so a uh, couple of other things that have happened uh, in the in the past uh, few days. Um, earlier this week, you may have seen some news about an asteroid hitting the planet Jupiter. And if I can share, I'm hoping I've got it set up here. Hang on just a second while I verify. No, I do not. Yeah, well, while you're getting that, I want to answer one question. Uh, Sharon, uh, hi, Sharon. Uh, you wanted to know what's being remodeled. And uh, since Chabot has become uh, an official NASA visitor center, and there's going to be a ton of uh, uh, new exhibit material, uh, the NASA experience is what the main exhibit is called. Uh, there had to be a remodel of the Spies building and uh, a lot of walls have been removed and space opened up in that main building to accommodate the new exhibit. So good question. Yeah. Nice to hear yeah. All right, so let me just share an image here. And then I think Richard, you've got a follow up one to this as well. Yeah, yeah I got a couple yeah. of follow -ups. Okay. I've always got something afterwards. Okay, right? all right. So this is the planet Jupiter and um, you notice over here, there's a little white object. That's one of the moons of Jupiter, and I forget which one. Don't quote me on which one it is. Uh, but quite often what happens is because of the orientation of the orbits of Jupiter's moons, the moons pass in front of Jupiter from our perspective. And when that happens, the moon will cast a shadow on Jupiter. So you see the moon and right here, you see the shadow of the moon. And it's very popular with amateur astronomers. That that's a good time to be taking images of uh, Jupiter to catch that uh, interplay between the moon and the shadow and Jupiter and so on and so forth. So a German uh, astronomer, his name is uh, Harold, and I can't pronounce his last name, but uh, you see it down here. Um, he was taking images of the transit of the shadow uh, across this, this, uh, Jupiter, and suddenly he spots this bright flash right here. And lo and behold, quite a few other amateur astronomers were doing essentially the same thing at the same time around the world. So several people caught this. This is the impact of an asteroid hitting the planet Jupiter. And this was, I believe, on the 13th of September. And uh, we, we estimate that the asteroid was smaller than 100 meters, but still pretty good size. So right at or just a little bit less than 100 meters in size. And it produces very bright flash, which lasted for 1.7 seconds uh, was the, the number I saw. Somebody actually measured the duration of it. And uh, this is because Jupiter is this big giant planet, very strong gravitational field, and asteroids get that get close to it get sucked into it, and they get an impact as it enters the atmosphere, and it's rather a, a violent explosion as the asteroid literally blows itself apart because of friction with the with the atmosphere. So this was a, a very fortuitous. Uh, catch. And like I say, it turned out that several uh, astronomers um, uh, were able to catch this uh, at the same time. Now, this has happened before. And there have been a number of occasions in the past where asteroids or comets have hit Jupiter. And for those of you who are old enough to remember, back in 1994, we had Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9, which was a comet, 
that got too close to Jupiter and Jupiter's strong gravity actually pulled the comet apart into a bunch of smaller chunks, which then remained in orbit for about a year before eventually also impacting um, Jupiter. These were very large chunks um, and they produced impacts that were so powerful that they actually disrupted the atmosphere and left huge blotches in the atmosphere uh, of Jupiter that lasted for days uh, and were easily uh, photographed from uh, the Earth. So, of course, the first question everybody asked was, okay, will this uh, impact leave behind some sort of remnant blotch in the atmosphere that will re remain there for days? And take it away, Richard. Yeah. All right. Well, actually, two things came up tonight on this topic. And uh, let me grab the screen share here. Uh, first of all, someone tonight asked me, well, how do we know that that bright flash wasn't a problem with the telescope or some kind of uh, uh, flaw in the optical train or just some kind of weird random event from the photographer. Did other observers capture the image? Because if it was only a data set of one, you have to ask all those questions. Uh, you know, was it actually real? Um, so I have here a photograph taken from a completely different part of the world. Uh, and this is uh, from Jose Luis Pereira in Brazil. Um, he's actually credited with the discovery, and I don't know if that is still the case or not, uh, but you notice that on the title of the uh, image, it says discovered by. Uh, that may or may not be accurate. I don't know if that's true, but you can certainly see the bright flash. And there it is. So we have at least uh, multiple astronomers uh, presenting the evidence. Um, now, as to Gerald's other point on whether or not this object left any uh, temporary scars, here is an image. Uh, first of all, you have to realize that this is inverted from the previous two images. But here is an image taken by Damien Peach, of course, uh, one hour after the impact. And the spot, if it had any longevity, would have appeared right around here in this area. And there is nada. So uh, it, Gerald is correct in that this was a uh, very brief event and not like Schumacher Levy, where it left uh, traces of itself for several days afterwards. All right. So that was um, one of the interesting things that happened uh, this week. And there was one other thing that happened just two days ago. Uh, the Earth got buzzed by a fairly good sized asteroid. Uh, the asteroid was called 2021 SG. And we think it was somewhere in the range of about 70 meters in size. Uh, for those of you who are uh, metrically challenged, that's about 220 feet. And, <laughs> and at about uh, 128 p.m. Uh, Eastern or, or Pacific time, rather, uh, it uh, passed. On, this is on the, on the 16th of September. It passed closer to the Earth than the moon. In fact, its distance when it was closest to the Earth was about 60, a little over 60% of the distance between the Earth and the Moon. So this was a pretty close call by a relatively good sized asteroid. So uh, pretty interesting event. Um, a number of astronomers, amateur astronomers, were able to capture images of it. Uh, I'm gonna share a graphic here just so you can see what I'm talking about. There you go. So, so this is Earth's orbit here, the long white line. I'm sorry, Earth's orbit is the long blue line. Blue line. Yeah, yeah, we're the blue line. The white line is the orbit of the asteroid. This is asteroid 2021 SG. And you can see that I tried to stop this animation at the point when it was closest to the Earth. Um, it's a little bit deceiving because 
both the asteroid is moving and the Earth is moving. So at the point where the asteroid actually crossed the Earth's orbital path, the Earth was farther back here. So this is the point when it was about the closest to the Earth. Um, this is not unusual in terms of close passes to the Earth. We get asteroids passing closer to the Earth than the moon numerous times every month, but most of them are much smaller than this asteroid. Uh, in fact, most of them are somewhere in the between five meters and 20 meters in size, so not very big. Uh, asteroids that small, if they were to enter the Earth's atmosphere, they would most likely burn up or break up, and so they wouldn't really cause a lot of damage on the Earth. This asteroid being a little bit bigger, somewhere, like I say, around 70 meters in size, uh, had it been a little bit closer and entered the Earth's atmosphere uh, in the right place, this would be a city buster. So uh, we, we dodged a bullet again. Harold, we got a question. Uh, did we know about the asteroid, or did we know it was coming um, I guess very far in advance would be a... Uh... Uh, no, we actually discovered it after it had made its uh, closest approach. We yeah. discovered wow. it. That uh, happens no. a oh, lot, no. right? No, I'm sorry. I'm thinking of another one. This one was actually spotted first on the 13th. So, so yeah, we got three days notice. Okay. So, you know, not, not no much problem. Time. <laughs> Plenty of time for you. Yeah, pack you, up yeah. your stuff. Pack up your stuff. <laughs> yeah. move, to, move to the other side of the planet. No problem, right? <laughs> so so I, this is actually true. Um, you know, I mentioned that we get buzzed by asteroids several times a month. In virtually all cases, not every case, but I would say 95% of those asteroids that we spot buzzing the Earth closer than the moon are discovered within just a few days of their closest approach, typically one or two days before or one or two days after they make their close approach. Uh, part of that is because, again, most of these asteroids are small, uh, less than 20 meters in size. You can't see them when they're way far away on the other side of the sun. Uh, but the other part of it is, uh, we can only look on the night side of the Earth. That's the only way right now for us to detect uh, asteroids. And that limits quite a bit what we can uh, view. If you look here, you can see that for most of its travel before it uh, reached the Earth, uh, it was on the day side of the Earth. So this is the night side over here. This is the day side. And we can't see it at all in the daytime. So there are a number of factors that limit our ability to spot asteroids like this when they are getting close to the Earth. Ideally, we, what we'd like to do is be able to discover asteroids not days before uh, they uh, impact the Earth. We would like to discover them years before mm -hmm. the impact. And that's the current technology, which is almost entirely based on ground-based telescopes, just doesn't have the capability to do that. But this year, finally, after being prodded and prodded and prodded for many years, NASA has finally agreed to build the NEO survey mission or NEOSM as we call it. And NEO stands for Near Earth, Near Earth Object. Most Near Earth objects are asteroids. And uh, this will be an infrared telescope that will be out in space where they can see a lot more and a lot better than anything we can do with ground-based telescopes. So uh, once um, the, the NEO survey mission has been launched, which will still be several years away, uh, we're going to see the rate of asteroid discoveries go up quite a bit. And we're going to get a lot more warning instead of, you know, th three days before or one day after or anything like that. We're going to get a lot more warning. And you combine that with the Vera Rubin telescope in, in uh, South America, which is going to go online here, I think, starting next year. Am I correct? Uh, Not sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's either know. next year or the year after. Uh, 
and it also is uh, going to be able to detect a lot more asteroids. So in the coming years, we're going to be doing a lot better at discovering these asteroids much sooner than the way it's working out right now. So anyway, those are some interesting events that happened in the last few days. Well, we have a we 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 do have a question about, uh, related to that, and uh, somebody was uh, very happy to learn. Stephen was happy to learn about uh, the uh, Jupiter impact and the near Earth asteroid. Uh, wants to know: Does the Chabot Observatory help locate near Earth asteroids, Gerald? Perfect question. Yeah, yeah. you know anybody that does that? <laughs> uh, I met a guy here once. Yeah. So the the answer is yes. Uh, the telescope that you see behind Richard and, and me, uh, I'll kind of turn my camera here. There's our telescope. This is our 36-inch reflecting telescope, the one we call Nelly. Nelly is a part of a global network of observatories that searches for and tracks near-Earth asteroids. So had the weather been right and other conditions been right, we may have been using that telescope that day uh, when that asteroid made that close approach. And, you know, we would have seen it. And, of course, immediately put on our hard hats and, you know, <laughs> got on the phone and called, called the wife and said, put on your hard hat. And <laughs> so, yes, we are doing that. All right. Um, <laughs> funny comment from Tim. Uh, it costs more to make a movie about asteroids destroying the Earth than it does to fund a program <laughs> to discover them in the first place. <laughs> Is, isn't that terrible? So, yeah. so true. Hey, yeah, so yeah, yeah. true. <laughs> oh, my God. Shows you where All the right. money is. Hollywood. Um, I have something I wanted to show. So we have a uh, club member who... Sadly, she's moved to uh, uh, Ohio. Is it Ohio? I always get Ohio and Iowa mixed up. Isn't that terrible? Yeah, yeah it's oh, it's Ohio. And uh, she they're both in the Midwest. <laughs> they are both in the Midwest. Yeah. You know, the flyover states, right? Isn't that? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't like saying that. Um, but. Uh, she is a tremendous astrophotographer. It's uh, Molly Wakeling, and she came up with an interesting image uh, this week. And if I can figure out how to share this, let me close this window and open this one. Bear with me here. Sorry about that. Go. Screen. There we go. If, if, if anybody is just joining us, uh, we are not able to observe with our telescope tonight because we are with overcast uh, skies and it's actually threatening to rain tonight. So uh, right. we're uh, we're winging it. We're we're doing a virtual. <laughs> yeah. We're doing a virtual virtual telescope program. So. That's right. Well, so this is an interesting object. This is um, a part of a catalog called the Cedarblad catalog. Uh, named after uh, an astronomer named Sven Cedarblad, and that was in the mid 20th century. Uh, actually, it was published in 1946, and this is Cedarblad 214 in the constellation Cepheus, and it's about 3,000 light years away. Um, the uh, this nebula and the rest of the objects in the catalog. Are, is what's called a diffuse nebula. And uh, the red glow is due to energized hydrogen gas uh, emitting light as the uh, gas de-excites as it cools down. And it really does glow deep red, as you see. Uh, what I find amazing about this image is that uh, she really spent a lot of time acquiring the data. Uh, this was taken over five nights, it looks like, and the total number of hours, let's see if I can find that, she, has, she had 164 five-minute subframes. So uh, the total number of hours is 13 hours and 40 minutes to acquire this image. 
And it just goes to show you, you can do pretty good astronomy in Dayton, Ohio. Um, this particular star here, are you able to see my pointer? Yes. All right, so this particular star here is in our immediate stellar neighborhood. It's uh, uh, less than one kiloparsec away. That's less than a thousand parsecs. And it burns um, much, much brighter than the sun. It is, in fact, she gave me this information in her description. Let me see if I can find this. It burns at 45,000 degrees Kelvin, which is 100,000 times brighter than the sun. So this is a really, really bright star. Even though it doesn't look like a major star in this image, uh, it is one of the hottest stars in our immediate stellar neighborhood. And then there's this open cluster of stars here in the foreground, and then the nebula uh, behind both of those. So anyway, that was a very but nice not, not to take uh, issue with you anything, but you, you yeah. said 45,000 Kelvin is 100,000 times hotter than our sun. It's actually 10,000 times hotter than our sun. Ah, well, I'm going to so correct her. It's, it actually, <laughs> actually a little less than 10,000 times hotter than our sun. Our sun, so what, our sun is at 5,800. What's one zero? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, What's yeah, a zero yeah. Wait, wait, wait. It's hot. <laughs> hey, hey, Richard, do we do we know what is um, energizing the hydrogen to, to make it glow in this nebula? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I don't know the details of this particular nebula. I suspect that the uh, that there are stars embedded within this region of gas that are heating it up, and as it disperses, it cools down and glows red. Is this a star? Exactly right. it's a, it's yes, a yes. It's a star yeah. forming region. Right, so. exactly right. Yeah, well, it, it's called it an emission nebula, nebula. And what's happening is embedded within this huge cloud of gas and dust are new stars that are forming. And some of those stars are very massive, very hot, and emitting a lot of ultraviolet radiation. And the cloud itself, the gas is mostly hydrogen. And uh, when you excite hydrogen atoms, the electrons bounce up to a higher energy level, and then they immediately bounce back down. And when they bounce back down, they emit light, and they emit light in a kind of a deep red color. And so that's what you're seeing going on here. So new stars are being born within this huge cloud. And if you look carefully, you can tell that it's a cloud because you can see dark and light areas and so on. And if you look, you can actually see that parts of the cloud extend out well beyond the frame of this image. And the other thing I want to point out is you notice these black areas, right? And it, these are, I know they, there's a temptation to think that they are holes in the cloud, but they're not. They're actually, it's foreground dust right. and it's foreground cool dust. And you can see that those uh, clouds of black dust uh, extend all the way out to these areas here. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and all the way to the top of the yeah, frame and, and all the way to the top. And it's just <laughs> the areas where they overlap the background nebula do you uh, see them uh, uh, show up very prominently? Yep. So anyway, this is a beautiful image. It's really yep. just got a tremendous yep. amount of detail for, uh, yeah. for uh, what is normally considered a fairly nondescript object. All right. All right. Very cool. So what else we got going? Well, I think we should, uh, you know, field questions from people. Yeah. Uh, and see uh, uh, what people might want to know about uh, on the topics we talked about or other astronomy topics uh, that we've talked about in the past or maybe never talked about. Um, so we're kind of open to, uh, to your questions for this evening. And uh, unless you guys have any other photos to show or other other news to uh, no. discuss. You know, uh, if you, you happen to be somewhere where, where the sky is clear, uh, you can see Jupiter oh. and Saturn are up tonight, and then the moon is off to the left of uh, Jupiter. The moon is uh, uh, waxing gibbous, so it's getting, I think we're like three days before full moon. Uh, well, there's something special about that full moon. And gonna that be, is? It's going to be the fall equinox. 
Oh, that's right. That's right. And that's on that's on the 22nd. And if you are really careful and have a good horizon and can actually see the moon rise, you might notice an interesting geometrical f phenomenon called the harvest moon effect. And this happens in the fall equinox and the geometry of the moon's orbit and the uh, Earth's orbit are such that the moon is appearing to rise further north each night rather than rising further to the west at a particular when I, rising further to the west is a bad way to say it but what 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 i'm trying to say is that the moon is moving to the north at a greater rate than it normally does and that makes it seem like the moon is rising close to the same time each night like within 20 minutes of the previous night for a period of three or four nights and then it starts to extend that time out again to 45 50 if, minutes. Yeah, yeah 45 minutes so right. yeah and yeah. it's and this is a phenomenon that happens in the fall and it's all due it's kind of an illusion that's due to the geometry of the uh of the moon's orbit and yep. anyway that's called the harvest moon effect yeah, the moon's orbit around the Earth, the moon does not orbit directly over our equator. Right. Uh, it's in an orbit that's tilted relative to our equator. It's also tilted relative to the plane of the Earth's orbit around the sun. So you get some pretty interesting ge geometric effects out of that. And this is one example of it's really, it's really hard to describe them too because we end up going ahead and pretending that we're you know this is the moon and this is the earth and it's going like this and we just confuse everybody yeah, yeah. uh so <laughs> i've tried i tried to find a decent graphic on this topic and i couldn't so I said, oh, well, i'll a, just tell people about it we need Get a graphics luck. we need a graphics uh, department in this group yes that's well, right. i i think we i think we should do a whole hour on just orbital mechanics myself you know <laughs> right so. I, i'm there I, i'm with you yeah. We, we did get a question about Molly's photograph. Um, someone wanted to know what, what equipment or what did she use? What uh, type of equipment? Did she I, use? Let me see yeah. if she mentioned what scope this was. She has several different rigs that she uses. Ah, here we go. So she used a Takahashi FSQ 106N. That's a 106 millimeter uh, refractor telescope. It's lenses, not mirrors. And uh, she uses a ZWO ASI 1294MC Pro camera, which is a CMOS camera. And uh, she was using what's called an Optolong L-Extreme 2-inch filter, which means that it's a color camera. So it does narrow band filtering, meaning it's going to be um, giving preference to the hydrogen alpha portion of the spectrum, hence the red color. Uh, on a color camera, and the mount is an Ioptron CEM40 mount. So that's the uh, those are the details on her rig. I hope everybody was taking notes because right, you'll be yeah. tested later. That's right, right, that's right. <laughs> hey, we had another another question that came up uh, on YouTube, uh, and the question was, uh, why did you name the telescope Nelly? Well, back in 2003, when this telescope was built. Uh, a lot of the funding for the telescope was provided by a gentleman named. Uh, uh, Go outside the door, Gerald. It's yeah. outside the door. Can't, oh, yeah. can't remember his name now. <laughs> Merrill uh, Martin. There, Merrill, Merrill Ma Martin. Merrill Martin. There you go. Thank you. Anyway, Merrill Martin's daughter and his grandmother were both named Nellie. So he decided to name the telescope after them. And I understand that his daughter hates being called Nellie. So, <laughs> so, so that's, that's funny. Story. I didn't know that part of the story. Yeah, I didn't know yeah. that either. So, so um, any other interesting questions? Uh, Maria asks, how long will Jupiter and Saturn be visible in the night? Oh, you got a couple well, months let's see. <laughs> yeah, we got a couple months left on that, sure. Yeah. 
It was a nice uh, view of uh, uh, Jupiter was fairly close to the moon last night when I was driving yeah. Uh, yeah. up through the Central Valley. It was actually quite dramatic. Yeah, I went to a Giants baseball game and I was sitting in the position where I was looking right at the moon the whole during the whole game <laughs> and sitting there with, with and you were you know, watching the moon and not paying any attention not to paying the, attention right? to the game <laughs> not, not only really that but but at 8 20 at 8 20 i knew that the international space station was going to be flying right over san francisco <laughs> so i'm sitting there in the stands with everybody around me watching the game and I'm sitting here doing this, looking for a space station <laughs> <laughs> and probably uh, attracting some unwanted attention from people. Right. You know? What is he looking at? <laughs> they, thought, they thought he saw a fly ball. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, yeah, we, we periodically, you will see the international space station go by. Uh, if you are, uh, outside tonight or anytime on a clear night in the next few days and you see Jupiter in the in the southern sky, the space station, when it's flying right overhead, can be even brighter than the planet mm -hmm. Jupiter appears. It can be quite bright. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to catch it at the right time, though. Uh, you have to catch it when uh, the sun is below the horizon, but it's still above the horizon from the perspective of the astronauts in the space station. The space station is about 250 miles above the surface of the Earth. So even though for you down on the ground, the sun has already set, maybe has set an hour ago, for them up there in, in space, they're still in sunlight. And so what we see is reflected sunlight off this huge structure that's 320 feet long, I believe it is. Um, it's reflecting all that light. And so it's very bright. And what's really interesting is to watch it as it moves across the sky and it comes to the point where it goes into Earth's shadow. And right in the middle of the sky, it all of a sudden just disappears. So uh, it's, a, it's a great thing to look for. If you uh, know how to look up, uh, there's several websites where you can look up and find out when the space station is going to go over your location and which direction to look and so on. And you want to look for that. It's pretty amazing. I'm just looking at the starry night here for a little bit and tracking Saturn and Jupiter. Saturn ought to be good. Um, it'll get into the western haze and, and sunlight maybe in December or so, late, middle of December or so. Jupiter, we could, we'll be able to watch in well into January. So, All right. Someone wanted to know why the uh, Lagrange uh, Lagrange area is so special. I've got a good slide for that. And uh, hold on for a second. Let me bring that up. So special for the James Webb or? or well, in general. Was that question? one was the context of my slide, but it, it's kind of general. So this oh, is, that's a good one. Uh, yeah, so what, what he's talking about are these various points in space called uh, Lagrange points. And what this image is, is a topographic map of space where the topography is gravity, right? And so the sun is here and it's causing a gravity well. The earth is here and it's got a smaller gravity well. And you can see that where the uh, the gravity wells uh, uh, become uh, less intense, you get these plateaus. And these plateaus are very stable from an orbital mechanics standpoint. And you have the Grange points that are plateaus, and you also have these Lagrange points that are more like saddles, L4 and L5. And the James Webb telescope is going to be parked out here at Lagrange 2. And it's always uh, on the far side of the Earth from the sun. And it's a very stable point. It's not going to fall down the gravity well. It's not going to fall down this side either. It's going to just kind of hang out here on this plateau. 
and without uh, much orbital adjustment required to keep it in its desired uh, uh, position. Yeah. And anyway, that's uh, it's just an interesting phenomenon when you have all these gravity wells, uh, and it's very handy for uh, parking uh, spacecraft. Yeah, the thing to, to understand is that James Webb Space Telescope will not be in orbit around the Earth. It will actually be in orbit around the sun. And because of this uh, gravity plateau, if you will, where the sun's gravity and the Earth's gravity both interact, uh, it can stay in that position. Ordinarily, if a object is orbiting the sun farther from the Earth, it will orbit slower than the Earth. So the Earth would overtake it and pass it. But at this particular point, because of the combined uh, gravity of both the sun and the Earth, James Webb Space Telescope ends up orbiting the sun at the same rate as the Earth does. So they are orbiting in parallel. Uh, if it was a little farther out uh, or even a little bit farther in, it would orbit at a slower rate than the Earth and the Earth eventually would overtake and pass it. But just at that one point is where the two will, will orbit parallel to each other and take the same amount of time to orbit the sun. Right. Good question. All right. Yeah. My answer is always slightly different. I haven't figured out the perfect way to describe it. Yet. Yeah. You know, <laughs> speaking, speaking of Lagrange points, uh, the Earth is not the only uh, planet that has Lagrange points. Um, all of the planets have them. Uh, and in particular, Jupiter has mm -hmm. Lagrange points. And the L4 and L5 Lagrange points, which uh, are 60 degrees uh, ahead of the orbital or the, the planet's you know, position in its orbit, and the other one is 60 degrees behind. Those, those are what we call L4 and L5. So you've got Jupiter here, 60 degrees behind it is one Lagrange point and 60 degrees in front of it on the same orbit. Uh, is the other one. And the combined uh, gravity of Jupiter and, and the sun are so strong there that asteroids that wander into that region get trapped there. Mm -hmm. And they stay there for millions of years. And we call those asteroids the Trojan asteroids. And in about a month, a spacecraft called Lucy is going to be launched and it is going to go out to uh, one of the Lagrange points to visit some of the uh, Trojan asteroids uh, and try to get a better handle on what kind of asteroids end up there, um, how stable are they while they're out there, uh, do they tumble, do they orbit kind of very stable or 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 what so uh you'll you'll be hearing more about that uh, in, the, in the next few weeks as nasa gets ready to launch the lucy mission to the trojan asteroids of jupiter that's, that's really, really interesting. cool i did not know about that yeah yeah, yeah. I, I, so... I wonder if it's gonna find my missing socks <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly right. yeah. the, the yeah. ones you lost in the dryer <laughs> they ended up in the Lagrange point. Yeah, so, yeah. so will the spacecraft actually end up uh, getting into that Lagrange point? Yes, yes. So, so it's it, it's going to go stay there. there. Hmm. Right, right. Um, in fact, that's not the only asteroid mission we're launching. You know, I mentioned a while ago about the uh, the uh, Neo SM or or uh, the Near Earth Object Survey mission. That's going to be a couple of years down the road. But another spacecraft that's going to orbit or be launched again a little bit later this year is the DART mission. DART mission is the Double Asteroid uh, Redirection Test, I believe it's called. Uh, and what's going to happen is that's a spacecraft that's going to go to a near-Earth asteroid that is a binary asteroid. It's actually two asteroids, a, a, a fairly big one and then a much smaller one. The smaller one is orbiting around, so it's like a moon of the asteroid. And 
uh, this mission, they're going to go there to test the ability to alter the orbit of an asteroid using what's called a kinetic impactor. And so the, the DART mission is going to go to this asteroid. It's going to fire a big, heavy bullet at that small asteroid and try to alter its orbit. And that's going to happen uh, next year, I think next spring is when, when they're scheduled to do it. Uh, but that's going to launch here also in about a month or so. So uh, a lot of asteroid stuff going on here in the next few months. It sounds like that's going to serve as a real reality check on uh, right, right, our right. ability yeah. to actually alter orbits of asteroids. Because, you know, it's been a great thought that we'd be able to do that. And uh, there's certainly been some movies made about that. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, I mean, it would be nice to know whether it's really realistic yeah, as soon as, as, soon really as, do it. soon as somebody makes a good movie about that i'll let you know so far yeah yeah the idea of that technology is to be able to deflect an asteroid just a little bit and yep. you know i was talking earlier about you know, discovering the asteroids years before they impact the Earth rather than days before. And the reason we want to do that is if we can discover an asteroid that is going to impact the Earth, if we can discover it years, and I mean several years, 10 years, 15 years before that impact, we can send a spacecraft there and deflect the asteroid, uh, deflect its orbit just a little bit. It takes only a very small deflection to put that asteroid into a different orbit that will miss the Earth. So that's the idea of this mission is to test that concept and that technology to make sure that we have that capability so that in the future we can have, you know, our asteroid uh, uh, gun ready to go to uh, deflect any asteroids that might have the Earth in its sights. All right. All right. What else have we got? Anybody else ask anything, John? I'm searching, scrolling no, through the some, list here. Some some humorous comments. <laughs> Yeah, oh Lucy, yeah, Lucy in the sky with asteroids. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Well, yeah, Mar Margo, what if they discover diamonds there? <laughs> yeah, don't don't discount the possibility. You know, it's actually a, it's actually realistic. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Di diamonds were the first minerals that formed when the universe was, was forming. So uh, it'd be a good it, place to find them. Yeah, of course <laughs> it'll all be dust, but it's diamond yeah. dust, which you know doesn't doesn't look too good on your finger, but you know. <laughs> So, all right, any other comments or questions? Fire away, folks. We got another 15 minutes here. So, uh, if, if you've got any asteroid questions or astronomical questions, questions about stars, uh, questions about planets. Oh, we, we did have a we, question earlier. Uh, somebody was wanting to know uh, uh, a, a good starter telescope and we yeah. were usually loath to make those recommendations we get but these questions yeah. all the time yeah and it's it's kind of a tough one to answer because you have to know the budget that the person is talking about and a lot of a lot of things about yeah. how they want to use the telescope so i always tell people really to get answer. a good pair of binoculars good yeah. pair of binoculars and then maybe yeah. a, a small dobsonian telescope right get right. the start, feel start of it out all. small yeah. Yeah. If you if you hunt around, you're liable to see a lot of advertisements for very expensive telescopes, you know, uh, a motorized mount that by itself costs two or three thousand dollars and then a fancy yeah. telescope that can cost upwards of ten thousand dollars. Not where you want to go if you're just starting out. On the other hand. Don't go to a department store. <laughs> Don't buy a telescope that says 300x on the box. In fact, if it has anything about its magnification on the box, don't get it. Don't get right. it. <laughs> right. That, that is, is um, a surefire indication that you're going to get a telescope that you're going to be disappointed with. So, That's the uh, PT Barnum telescope. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, the the uh, uh, other advice I would give people, because you mentioned the Dobsonian telescope and I've mentioned binoculars, uh, a lot of people make the mistake of buying for their first telescope uh, one that comes on an equatorial mount, meaning it's got to be aligned to the pole star for the correct latitude before you're able to reasonably find anything and follow anything. And as a beginner, that's a very difficult thing to do because maybe you're not even sure where the pole star is and getting the alignment down is a challenge and using an equatorial mount to find something, especially if it's one that's not a go-to mount, but one where you have to manually uh, move the telescope can be very challenging. And a, a Dobsonian scope is more like a cannon turret, right? It moves up and down and back and forth on a, uh, a platform that rotates. So you can point it at anything very easily without having to go through any advanced setup or calibration. So uh, that's a really nice way to start. And a lot of people never stop using Dobsonian uh, scope. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're, yeah. Really, they're really uh, excellent and they're very- uh, easy, easy to set up and easy to use. Uh, you know, the only small downside to it is that because of the rotation of the earth, right. uh, whatever object you're looking at is going to drift through your field of view in the Dobsonian. So you have to keep nudging the telescope a little bit, but you get used to that very quickly and it becomes a real uh, simple thing to do. And like Richard says, there, there are amateur astronomers who they get so attached to their Dobsonians, they don't want to get anything else. And then there are they other... want bigger and bigger Dobsonians, right? And, and, and then, right. There's, then there's always the guy who's got a lot of money and goes out and spends $20,000, $30,000 on, on telescope equipment and some of them actually get very serious and do a very good job. Some of them say, why did I buy this thing? <laughs> you know? yeah. Can't figure out how to use it. You know, So, so start small. Oh, here's start a good, small, try before you buy. Here's a good question that I don't have an answer for. Are there any radio telescopes near Chabot or UC Berkeley? I'm not huh. aware of any radio telescopes nearby. I'm not either. Yeah, big there's ones. some there's, big ones anyway. There's, there's one up in Hat Creek. In fact, uh, it was threatened by the uh, the fire. Fires. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, there's the Hat Creek array, and there's a big array in Owens Valley. Right. Um, and uh, those are the only two significant radio telescopes in california that i know about tim do you know about anything else tim thompson's out there he would know yeah another question that uh, came up on youtube does narrow band filters help for direct observing and he says he's not planning to do uh astrophotography so uh if you're not planning to do astrophotography uh, sometimes narrow band filters can be nice if you're trying to look through, uh, for example, if you're looking at a nebula that's got a lot of mm -hmm. oxygen uh, in it, uh, there's what we call an oxygen or O3 filter, which makes the oxygen, the, the ionized oxygen, stand out a lot better. Uh, so they uh, narrow band filters can help in some respects. Uh, you, you can also use... Uh, the, the broader color filters, you know, red, green, and blue to bring out details on Mars or on Jupiter and things like that. Uh, so, so you can use the filters to, uh, to, you know, some advantage when you're doing visual observing, but they come in particularly handy when you're doing astrophotography. We have another James Webb question that I just saw pop up. And I'm yeah, I saw that. You want me to read it? It's uh, yeah, yeah. yeah so he read that the James Webb will be able to see in the near and far infrared. What does that mean? Well, I have an answer to that. Let me share something here. It's kind of funny that we ended up showing these slides because I was thinking about showing them anyway. <laughs> All right. So. so When your light that would normally be in, let's say, this part of the spectrum, 
gets shifted by the time we see it all the way over to the red side. Things that are moving away from us are shifted to the red. Things that are moving towards us are shifted to the blue. In order to see the spectrum of light from the farthest perceivable objects in the universe, that mean, meaning like the cosmic microwave ba you know, background radiation being the farthest that we've been able to see, but also anything that's even maybe as far or farther, we have to have a telescope that's very sensitive to the red part of the spectrum. And that's where the James Webb Space Telescope comes in. And it's got mirror coatings that are very good at reflecting infrared light. And it has instruments on board that are very good at detecting infrared light. So we'll be able to look at stellar spectra of extremely distant stars from the very beginning of time. The other thing we'll be able to look at much closer to home is deeper down into the atmospheres of Jupiter and Saturn because there is a lot of data that we can gather about uh, lower levels of those atmospheres uh, that can only be detected with infrared light. Okay. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, let me, let, me, let me add a little bit to that. Uh, Please. Um, if you look at the the middle bar there, which is the non red red shifted or blue shifted uh, spectrum, um, way over to the left you see red light. All right, that is the extent of the red color that we can see with our eyes, but the electromagnetic spectrum is actually much wider. There is additional uh, radiation that is beyond the red and that's what we call infrared and just beyond it is what we call near infrared and much farther beyond it is what we call far infrared so there's actually a very wide range it's wider than the entire visible spectrum that we call the infrared spectrum and the the part that's closest to the visible spectrum we call near infrared the part that's farthest we call far infrared. Uh, Richard, if you can put that image back up just one oh, more sure. because I, I want to elaborate on one other thing that you were one. saying. Yeah. So just to, to clarify yeah, give me uh, a one other thing. I'll, yeah. I'll get that. So, so that's what we mean by near infrared and far infrared. The Hubble Space Telescope can see into the near infrared part of the spectrum. So we can already see a little bit of the infrared part of the spectrum. The, the, the key thing about the James Webb Space Telescope is we can go much deeper into mm -hmm. the infrared part of the spectrum. So that's what we're talking about when we say near infrared and far infrared. It's the part to the left of these uh, rainbow patterns that you see here out in the part that we can't see with our naked eye called the infrared. Okay, the other thing I wanted to mention is you, you said something in describing this uh, that was, uh, I, I want to clarify a little bit. If you look at, again at the middle bar, that's the, the standing still spectrum of a star, just random star, all right? And what you see is these dark bars. Those are called absorption lines. And the composition of the star is we can identify by looking at those absorption lines. So, you know, a star has got hydrogen in it. It's got uh, helium in it. It may have some carbon in it. It may have some other materials, all of which absorb light at different wavelengths. And by looking at the absorption spectrum, we can identify what the composition of the star is. When we talk about redshift and blue shift, what happens is if the star is moving rapidly away from us, all of those absorption lines move toward the red part of the spectrum. The light itself doesn't move to the red part of the spectrum. The absorption lines move to the red part of the, the spectrum. So if you look, again, the middle one is the, mm -hmm. the stationary spectrum, if you will. The one up above, that's a star moving away from us. 
all of the same absorption lines are there, but they've all shifted towards the red end of the spectrum. And you can imagine that if it's far enough away and you were using a standard visible light telescope, they would migrate all the way off to the point where you can't see them anymore. Right. And that's right. why you need the infrared instruments. Right. Conversely, if it's moving toward us, then all of those lines get shifted towards the blue side of the spectrum. So we say they are blue shifted. And the amount that they shift depends on how fast the star is moving away from us or toward us. The faster it's moving, the farther it will be shifted. We can actually calculate the velocity toward us or away from us by simply measuring how much those absorption lines are shifted. Hey, uh, right. Deb, thank you for that. That was hey. great. Uh, that's yeah, that's really good. Debbie made a great comment uh, for people that are looking for telescopes. Uh, a lot of astronomy clubs have loner scope programs, including Ace Bay Astronomical Society. We we have a, a loner scope program, so it's it's something worth looking into if you want to try out yep. a telescope uh, before buying anything. You could uh, borrow one or, or sort of rent one for a, a few months and uh, see, what, see what you can learn, see if you can learn how to, how to use it and uh, get an idea of what you might want to buy. And almost none of them are department store telescopes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we don't deal with those. <laughs> Try not to anyway, as much as people want to donate them to us. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? It's almost 10 o'clock here, I think. Yeah, we made it to 10 o'clock. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Uh, that was fun. And uh, even if we can't see the sky, we always find something fun to talk about. And right. we appreciate your questions and your interest. Um, we'll be here again next week, and hopefully you will, too. So uh, come join us again in a week. What have you got, Gerald? Uh, I want just want to remind everybody, <laughs> remind everybody that this week it's summer. When we come back to you a ah. week from now, it'll be the fall <laughs> because right. the equinox is in between now and next weekend. Yeah. So, and, and because that second. full moon occurred or occurs just before the equinox, that's why we had the blue moon last month. Yeah, we ended up with four. <laughs> full moons in a in a in, in one season right exactly right yeah mm -hmm. yeah so so we will see you in the fall <laughs> right so. or as don likes to say in the future yeah there you go <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> okay right. good night